Jean, clerk, please call the roll. Here. 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 On Durko. Here. Okay, at this time, uh, we're going to open it up for public comment for items not on the agenda. This time is reserved for those people in the audience or online. Are we on Zoom? Do we have anybody on Zoom? Okay. Okay. Uh, anyone in the audience who wishes to address the Planning Commission on subjects that are not on the agenda, we're going to set aside three minutes for public comment, and we'll open it up right now. Any hand? Any hands on Zoom? Okay, we're going to close public comment. At this point, we're going to move on to the adoption of agenda. On the uh, adoption of the agenda, do we have a motion to adopt the agenda? I so move. I'll second. Okay. I'll second. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Commissioner DePillo. Yes. Commissioner DiMartini. Yes. Chairman Andurco. Yes. Okay, public comment on the consent agenda. We have a consent agenda, and this is an opportunity for anyone from the public to comment on the consent agenda. Any hands on Zoom? Okay, let's bring it up for a motion. That we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner DiMartini? Yes. Commissioner DePillo? Yes. Chairman Underco? Yes. All right. Consent agenda is adopted. At this time, we're going to move on to business of the agenda planning commission workshop. And we have a um, representative from, let's see. Chairman mm -hmm. so, Undergo, if I may. Um, we have Aaron Ventura with Hauge Brook Associates, who will be giving our presentation um, along with myself. And I will start um, the presentation. And just to give you some background on Erin, um, she is a planner with um, Hauge Brook Associates. She has extensive experience with city planning. Um, and she is assisting the, the town right now doing staff um, contract planning on our larger projects. So things like Hidden Grove or large subdivisions. Welcome, Erin. All right. Well, let's start the workshop. There we go. And then maybe we can move that down. Okay. So we're going to do a planning workshop. Um, let's go to the next. Uh, we're going to cover land use regulation, uh, the general plan, zoning codes, or the zoning ordinance, um, the California Environmental Quality Act, and the role of the planning commission. So I'm going to start off going over land use regulation and then the general plan, and then um, Aaron will take over from there. Uh, so land use regulation arose from good government movements as a response to unsanitary urban conditions. So think of, oh, go to the next slide. Think of um, industrial revolution and factories next to people's homes and waste being uh, going going anywhere. <laughs> and so the plan is then to allow for some regulation so that we don't have a lot of health, safety, or welfare issues. So. The original was based on local government's police power, and it embodied a desire to rein in private market excesses through government regulation. So in California, um, our milestone began in 1927 uh, when California passed a law requiring cities and counties to have a what they called a master plan. So today we have a general plan, but at that time they called it a master plan. And then in 1928, there was the Standard City Planning Enabling Act. Um, as you can imagine, people 
not everyone was pleased having rules and regulations placed upon them and their their property. So, um, you know, these these laws came about um, in light of of those uh, the pushback that was received. So, under California law, we have general plans which lay out a jurisdiction jurisdictions, future development plans through a series of policy statements and text and land use diagrams. So those who participated in our many committees or attended any previous um, planning commission or town council meetings are familiar with what our general plan looks like and what changes are being proposed currently. Um, another uh, Planning document are specific plans, which are a special set of development standards that apply to a particular geographic area. Um, other types of plans that are similar to that are master plans, area plans, vision plans, but they're not defined by law as a specific plan would be, which would have um, required content. And then there's zoning, which provides detailed land use and design regulation consistent with the general plan. Uh, there's a relationship between these do documents. So your general plan is your overarching document for the town. Uh, it sets the tone, it provides uh, direction and guidance, um, but it's all looking at things at a very high level. You're in an airplane looking down at the town. Underneath that are specific plans, area plans, zoning, standards, guidelines, um, the subdivision maps, development permits, conditional use permits, variances, capital improvements, those all fall at the bottom, but are guided by the general plan as that guiding document. All of these must contain, must be consistent with the general plan. So we can't have standards that contradict the general plan. That's just a bad idea in general. And what this chart doesn't show is that there are also state and federal laws that are above our general plan. So there, while our general plan might say one thing, the state might come in and say, no, we think you, can, you should allow this or we're requiring you to allow this. Um, so that can be anything from you know, air quality. We have the EPA, Air Pollution Control Districts, the Air Resources Board, waterways with the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and roads, for example, with Caltrans. Um, we could put something in our general plan regarding a new on-ramp, but Caltrans might feel differently about that. So again, mandatory consistency between the general plan, specific plans, municipal code, and then standards and guidelines. So what is the general plan? It's basically the constitution of the town for planning and development. Um, it provides a long range, long range vision for the town. So 20 to 25 years or so. Um, it identifies important community issues and solutions. Uh, it's the basis for our land use decisions. When projects come in uh, or we're looking at different things that are going on in town, we're referencing that general plan to say, is this, is this appropriate or not? Um, based on what we have established in those policies. Um, the general plan promotes community participation. So as you participated in a lot of our committees for the general plan update, those are ways to participate. Um, the public can come to our meetings. That's also part of something that is part of our general plan. Um, the general plan sets the ground rules for how we engage uh, different projects, different issues that come up. Uh, everything that affects our town. And then it also sets a timeline for implementation. So general plan timeframes, uh, it's again, the 20 year planning horizon on average, um, every five years, it should be updated to maintain, uh, maintain relevance. Uh, we can have things that are outdated, new technologies come in, new issues pop up and you wanna maintain uh, relevance for your general plan. Um, there can be annual updates. So someone might come in with a project and they might feel that they need to change the land use designation. And that might be a good idea, depending on the project. Um, so they're going to ask for an update to the general plan for that uh, change and designation. Um, so when we say maximum four per year, that means maximum four per year per element. 
So we don't, there are times when you can have a lot of changes. Uh, the state might mandate you to add something or um, you might have the county come up with a new plan that we should be adopting. So you want to, you're updating with those, but you have to also watch, watch how many you've done, <laughs> keep track of it for each year. And then there's the annual progress report to the um, uh, Housing and Community Develop Development Department and then um, the Office of Planning and Research. So they're looking at how what progress have you made if, with your housing element, what progress have you made with all of your implementation measures in your general plan. Uh, there are required general plan elements. So we have land use, housing, circulation, conservation, open space, noise, safety, air quality for the San Joaquin Valley and environmental justice uh, required in, in areas where that is an issue. Um, our general plan includes these things. <laughs> uh, they don't have to be their own separate element. You can combine them. So you can have noise and safety together in one element. Um, air quality can go with conservation, if that makes sense for your community. Um, and in our update, we will include an environmental justice piece. Um, we don't really hit any triggers for environmental justice here in Loomis, but it's good to have that. And it's good to reflect the other portions of our policies and other elements that um, affect environmental justice and, and implement our goals for that. So optional general plan elements, you can include any, any topic as an optional element. Um, areas that have a lot of historic resources um, or you know, a, a events, they might be gold mining communities, they might have a his history or a um, historical resources element in, included. Others will um, take apart parks and rec and be, that will be it, its own element. Um, so for Loomis, we currently have a public services facilities and finance element that's in our existing general plan. And in our update, those will still be included along with uh, economic development to go with finance. And then parks and rec will be combined with open space. Um, other communities have uh, elements on design um, or they combine that with land use. Um, Again, public health can be combined with safety, uh, economic development, um, with finance, and then you can have other community specific topics wherever you happen to be located. So the elements have contents they're required to have. So there needs to be a setting, uh, narrative, vision, and expectations, goals, objectives, policies, and implementation measures that are often scheduled or, and or quantified. So there's a hierarchy to this. So the, the top of that is, is the vision. So it's an as, aspirational statement describing desired positive future for the community, an image of the future that the community wishes to create. And it's a succinct description of community values. This could be your town mission statement. Um, below that are goals. So um, these are ideal future ends that um, that's an expression of your community values. So those can be abstract, big concepts. They're not quantifiable or time dependent. And beneath that, there are objectives. So intermediate or achievable steps to achieve those goals. Um, generally, they're quantifiable with achievement desired in a set period of time. And then beneath that, there are policies, so specific statements that guide decision making. Um, they can be a rule or a measure establishing a required level of quality or quantity to be fulfilled by others. Um, these get more detailed than the, your goals or your objectives. And beneath that are actions or implementation measures to make those policies come to life. <laughs> So there are actions, procedures, programs, or techniques that carry out the general plan policy. Um, often there's a source of funding or a time frame for implementation. Some of those will be ongoing things. Um, for example, coordination with South Placer Fire would be something that's ongoing. Um, there can be short-term action items that you want to accomplish in the, in the near term within five years. Uh, medium term, which might be things that require more um, 
more planning, more funding, and those would be, you know, in your six to 15 year range. Um, and then long term, these are things that you hope to achieve um, and that there's funding and, and a proper planning available for them. And then there can be indicators, so measures showing whether the community is achieving its goals and objectives, and um, that can come forth with uh, the annual progress report. So here's a sample of the from the draft general plan update um, showing a goal um, to assist our school district and the Loomis Library and Community Learning Center um, to provide educational opportunities. Um, then there's an objective below that, so the provision of adequate schools, then a policy to go along with that objective. Loomis is working with the school district to review land use decisions, and then an implementation measure. So continuing to the joint use agreements with the schools for um, community and educational and recreational access to school facilities um, and achieving a fair and affordable usage fees. So that's an ongoing implementation measure. The general plan update will have other policies and objectives related to that. Um, so that's just a sample of how one leads into the other. And then here's um, our general plan land use diagram. So you can see it's very colorful. <laughs> Each land use designation has its own color code. So it's easy to see um, what everything is. Uh, you can find your parcel and figure out what your designation is. And then there's numbers on some of those showing um, additional policies or requirements associated with that particular land, land area. I can just emphasize, you know, it's real. I, I don't know if this is planned to be a discussion, but um, you know, it's important when we have uh, uh, zoning to think of like uh, you know, regions, right? Uh, zoning regions. You wouldn't want to put your industrial and scatter everywhere. You want your industrial in a certain uh, location. You want your residential over in a, another location. Your parks, and so it's it's a way to organize uh, um, your your intended land uses, and so. Right, um, right. So that's, and the map provides that visual of um, making sure that you don't have a bunch of residential uses located right next to your heaviest of industrial types. Um, otherwise, you're back to 1927. And, <laughs> and the reason why some of these are coming forward. Um, so that's a very key, key thing and a very key piece of the general plan is that is that designation and that uh, diagram. So uh, if there's no other questions. Well, why don't we pause and uh, see if there's any uh, questions uh, of the Planning Commission at this point or points that anyone wants to make? Okay. Okay. And so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to finish the presentation. Thank you, Christy. So um, like Christy just went through the general plan, the mm -hmm. view of the town from the airplane level. So the uh, implementing documents that the town uses or any city or town would use to kind of get from airplane level to lot specific or the specific plans. Uh, there are none right now currently in the town of Loomis, but a specific plan would be for a, a large scale development. And it's almost like a little mini general plan for a small area within the community. Specialty plans, the downtown center master plan is one that's here in this community. The zoning code with the zoning map, title 13 of the municipal code. Um, standards would include like various engineering type documents and standards, streets, things like that. Guidelines, design guidelines, um, and then also the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA, which I'm gonna go more into. So first we'll, Stop the zoning code. So it's an ordinance that implements the general plan policies. Uh, this is the zoning map here up on the wall. It looks similar to the general plan land use map. There needs to be consistency within the two of them. And like Chair mentioned, is you know kind of keeping certain uses together. So you can see, you know, the colors are kind of grouped together. Um, oftentimes in communities like this or older communities that have kind of grown and have different uses scattered out sometimes the use doesn't match what's its zone underneath so you will find inconsistencies with what's out there versus the map um, the zoning ordinance allows what can and cannot be done so in each section under each uh, different zoning district 
There's lists of allowable uses, uses that are allowed with conditional use permits or uses that are not allowed. Um, we, it also includes things like setbacks, heights, lots, lot coverage, minimum lot size, and things like that. The CEQA. Um, CEQA is an information, informational and disclosure document that analyzes the potential impacts of a project. Um, there are certain requirements that make a project an actual project under, under CEQA. Sometimes a project can be exempt under CEQA. Um, this is to disclose information and to help decision makers make decisions. So it is one piece of the information packet you need to be able to make a decision. So, so the contents of a CEQA document is it describes the proposed project. Uh, it will disclose the purpose and the need for the project, the existing conditions, the settings. It identifies the potential impacts, ways to avoid those impacts, ways to reduce the impacts on the environment, um, identifies impacts that cannot be mitigated. And that is, a, is it may be something you come across one day when you get an environmental document is, you, it's a trade-off. We have to decide, okay, this project is going to affect the environment. So what can we do to mitigate it the best we can? And if we can't, is that a trade-off we're willing to make in approving this project? Because Obviously, when you develop undeveloped areas or intensify uses, there, there are potential impacts or there are impacts to the environment. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, and there has to be, is there have to be justification if we say that we're willing to take the impacts over what? The yes, there, it's, a, it's called the um, statement of overriding consideration. consideration. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't know, I know you're new to the commission, but these are all things that us as the planners hold your hand, explain to you all along the way. So it's never going to just be like, here's the, here's the document. Make the decision. Yourself. That makes <laughs> so sense. So we are here. Um, also, it fosters intergovernment cooperation. These documents are published out to other agencies for review and comment, and it also public participation. There are many opportunities for the public to participate. For example, before we would even engage in the environmental review process, we the the town would put out a notice of preparation saying we are going to start the environmental review process. We're going to hold a scoping meeting where the community or agencies are able to come or submit comments saying we have a concern that this may be an impact because sometimes how is the town or the consultant to know exactly what impacts to study if we aren't familiar there? We're not, you know. The traffic is always really bad at this in intersection. And so um, the neighbor knows that because they live at that intersection. I mean, something like that would be studied in a traffic study, but things like that. So it's just important to know that there, there are many opportunities both at the beginning um, and throughout the process and at the end for comments to be received by staff to, to reveal. So like I mentioned, there's categorical exemptions, infill projects, single family houses, um, minor land subdivisions, things like that. Those are exempt from CEQA. So it is, it's kind of determined that, that this, a project of that size won't have an impact. Um, the first step in, a, in an environmental review is the initial study. There are, what is it, 17 sections of it, something around there now. Um, you know, aesthetics, air quality, traffic, noise, cultural resources, population and growth, recreation, that um, a checklist that you would go through and say, yep, impacts, no impacts, an impact that can be mitigated. It's kind of your first glance through this all. So in some cases, if you know it's going to be a big project that's going to require an environmental impact report, sometimes those can be skipped, but it's nice to have that as kind of the, the, the um, starting off point. So the next would be a negative declaration. You go through your initial study, you determine that there's not going to be an impact and you de declare that there's no environmental impact and the project can proceed. A mitigated neg negative declaration, there may be impacts, but through general plan policies, we can mitigate any potential impacts, or I'm sorry, through mitigation measures, you can 
mitigate those. And, and so a full-blown EIR is not needed. And then the kind of most in-depth doc document is the environmental impact report. That's where you'd have your um, statement of consideration of overriding. Yes. Um, and it would lay out the the impacts that potentially cannot be mitigated it also lays out alternatives. Don't do the project. Uh, you know, move the project, reduce the size of the project, remove a component of the project, things like that. Okay. So the role of the planning commission, um, you are doing the planning work of the town council. That's typically what the, you know, the role of planning, you're doing the land use, the zoning, those types of things, the conditional use permits. You're making those planning type recommendations to the town council. Um, you, the council typically has the planning commission facilitating workshops to get the community involved and in getting their input on planning related things. Um, the housing element is a big planning commission thing, zoning code, uh, and like I said, study sessions and other different types of forums. So you are appointed by the town council, as you all probably know. Uh, you are not the policy makers, that is the council, but you are making recommendations to them on policy, general plan, specific plan, zoning code. You're that first, you're that first review of you know, the board before it goes to them. So there are projects that the approval stops at town council, or I'm sorry, at planning commission. Um, and then there are some that go take your recommendation that goes to the town council. So site and architectural review, conditional use permits. Um, yes, yeah, in, in the review of those types of projects, you're making sure that there's some consistency with the general plan. Again, Christy and I don't just like leave that up to you guys to decide. We make sure that, that that's the type of information that's included in our staff reports and in conversations um, and is laid out, uh, laid out for you before you make those types of decisions. And obviously uh, you conduct public hearings. So the traits of a planning commissioner, know your community. You understand the community probably better than the staff does. The, you live amongst the residents. You know the problems, you know the strengths and weaknesses of the community. You know the history, where it's going, things like that. So that is very important in, um, in bringing that history and knowledge to the commission to be able to represent the community. Your personal expertise, I'm not sure what people's backgrounds are, but you know, oftentimes engineers or architects or um, you know, things like that that can bring to their, their professional expertise to the commission or able to see things or read things in different ways than a, a lay person kind of can. But um, so another very important trait is to be open-minded uh, to kind of take, when you get the information in the project, you know, look at it with a really open mind, de novo, not, oh gosh, I really don't like that person or they've been a, you know, hard to work with in the past. So, but I don't want to make it easy for them now. Um, that's, that's not your, your role. And to use, um, yeah, just to kind of review everything with a very open mind. The ability to see strengths and weaknesses in proposals and make suggestions too along those lines. Um, critical thinking skills and working towards solutions. There will be times uh, where not everyone agrees or wants to vote the same way. And in a situation like this, if you had an even number of commissioners, you know, it's important to work towards a solution because, um, you know, the, the vote would be split in half and it, you, the outcome may not be what's best because um, so, you know, to have open discussions where everyone is being respectful of each other, hearing things, listening, and making decisions based on the information that they have received. So a willingness to spend time to study the materials, you know, a environment, an EIR is a big, huge, thick document. A general plan is a big, huge, thick document. So um, to, to come prepared if you're not prepared, it's really hard to be effective at your job in this. And I think, you know, Christy and myself are here to help with that, give cliff notes or send you in the right direction on what the most important parts of the documents are, because sometimes there are 
parts that could be skimmed versus fully studied. So make sure you always reach out to us. But um, you know, the importance of reading the staff report, that's going to give you all the information that you need to help make that decision. It's going to point you in the right directions of where in these big documents you should be looking, where in the general plan, what general plan policies are we, um, you know, saying they're consistent with, things like that. And again, like the draft documents, we know that they're big and thick. Don't read them at nighttime sometimes because you'll fall right asleep. But um, there is important information in there. And really, it's the basis of the decisions you're making. So faith in the future and the ability of the community to shape what the future is. I mean, um, you know, growth is inedible, is, is going to happen. And so making sure that you are helping to shape it in the right direction of what you think is um, best for the community. Okay, next. So how do you deal with the information that you receive? Again, read staff reports, read them prior to meetings, ask us questions prior to meetings, especially if it's something that's a little bit more complicated than what's the setback here. You know, we wanna be able to, to bring all of the information you may need to make a decision or, or information to inform the public and to so they have a better understanding of the problem of uh, the project. Again, the environmental uh documents you can visit the site read about the project like if there's been previous projects again these are things reach out to us and we can send you in the right direction um and always as staff i always encourage commissioners if they have meetings or visit the site or walk the site with the applicant to disclose those in the public meeting I just want, you know, I, I visited the site with the applicant, we walked around, we looked at it. Okay, so it's in the public, it's in the public record, and then there'll be no questions, you know, oh, I saw them walking around the site, what were they doing? Well, I was visiting the site with the applicant, they were showing it to me, okay, you know, and it's, it's all very transparent. Um, yes, next. So questions to ask as commissioners, and a lot of this stuff is are the answers that we will give you. We aren't going to ask you to look in the municipal code to tell us if to check the setbacks and the heights or this and that. That's that's the stuff staff will review. But um, so then that information will be in your reports. So the compliance with the code and the general plan, what type of environmental review is required, those are th that's the information we'll give you. Um, and what you then decide is take that information, ask the questions, listen to the community, and then decide what's best for the community with that. So this perspective of a commissioner is you have the no local knowledge um, to understand prior decisions. Again, talk to other commissioners, other council members, staff on that. Um, but you you have probably a better understanding of what policies and programs and approaches in the community aren't working. Like what needs to be changed? You're you know you're out here. You're here. People people probably come talk to you about their problems or things they want changed once they know you're on the planning commission. So it's you know it's your role to kind of bring that information back to to staff and to the to the council to make sure that they know you're the eyes and ears for the community um, and have confidence in your decision. And I. It, it, may feel at times intimidating being up here, um, but know that if you did your research and you are doing your best, that you should be confident in the decisions that you're making if you keep the best interest of the community at the forefront of it all. So working with staff, kind of like I mentioned before, we'll, we'll provide you with the, the information you need to make a decision. We, we, that, that's our job as staff is to provide you with that information. Um, so, and like anytime we can have questions addressed to us prior to meetings, it's just really helpful so that we can have that information and have the correct answer or additional information as needed. If, so. if I could interject. So if you do have questions coming us coming to us in advance allows us time to research it. Well, I'd like to be an encyclopedia of endless yes. knowledge. 
often I don't know every last detail off the top of my head of, of a project. And so if I know that's something you're particularly interested in or have questions about, then I can make sure I'm, I'm checking that, you know, what is the dimension of that sign or, or, yeah. or whatever is, is piquing your interest. So, um, it, it helps and it helps us to better serve you uh, in mm -hmm. your decision making. Yeah. And I think at, in working with staff or coming to staff at this point, the commission will still be going to Christy. Um, my role moving forward is to assist on some of the larger projects that will potentially be coming forward. And so we'll, there'll be more of a clear, a clear time of when questions will can come to me and things like that. But for right now, it will all go through Christy. Um, working with the community, again, you are the eyes and ears out there and you have information and understand the processes. Hopefully, you know, when someone comes to you and asks, why is this allowed here? Or this not allowed there? You can talk to them about, oh, because of our zoning ordinance and our land use element, like that's why things are allowed where they are. Um, again, when your neighbors come to you and say, I want to build a guest house in my backyard, you can say, well, okay, yeah, you can do that. Why don't you go talk to Christy <laughs> and she can help you with that, those types of things to help and help to get accurate information out into the community. I, I, I've been doing this long enough that I know how the rumor mill and the planning world works, you know, and it's nice when you have advocates out there advocating and spreading um, accurate information about how how planning works in the community so one, one thing i'd like to use the website so yeah i've had questions the community team. i'm like well if you want to read that go to the website yep so plan download that read and understand it and then be prepared for questions that includes some of the laws coming down some other things so the website so far i think has been really well done and i mean i think there's some updates that can be done too as well for easy access but that's i think at least my yeah. workflow process so so far, so good. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I think the municipal code is is pretty easy. You can search it, and then so you're not going through a huge, huge, do overwhelming document. So that can be a resource to you or to send someone um, that way. But yeah, I mean, again, those are all things we as staff will want to know too. Like, can we add something about this on the website? A one page handout, if we have it, we can put up there, or something we can make to put up there because that um, frees up a lot of staff time and resources answering those little questions that can be answered over and over and over again with a one page handout or a link to another document on there. I, I have found it helpful when people have come to me with questions to, uh, like Nate uh, mentioned, to uh, direct them to the website, but introduce them to staff because the staff really are the experts on on these items and um, I'm not. Um, so, uh, you know, if people are looking for accurate information, it's best to get them in front of staff. And, yeah. Um, and they can give them the give them the resources they need to uh, better understand the, the 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 subject matter. I mean, that's really what people are looking for. Oftentimes, is just information, good solid information. And, yeah. And um, as a planning commissioner, that's not always you know it's not what we do Monday through Friday. So um, we have excellent staff here, and uh, they do a great job at fielding questions and providing information to the public. Yeah. I mean, I think you're an expert in the community let us be the experts in the policies, the documents, the ordinances, things like that. So I think that's the easiest way to work together. Um, so one thing I wanna point out is the Brown Act. And if you have any questions about that, ask, you know, you can talk to one person on the commission, but you can't talk to two because then a majority of the commission will have had a conversation about an, uh, about an item in, in private, and these current types of conversations need to be in public. So again, anytime you think, if you have a question, ask, ask, ask. You do not want to be put in a situation when you've had a Brown Act violation on accident, on purpose, um, because it just, it, it could question credibility, um, things like that. And so I'm assuming that the city town attorney probably does some Brown Act training. And if not, we can. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we can schedule that. Yeah. If, if we feel that we have questions on what's appropriate or not. Um, 
We have ethics uh, workshops training right. and certification annually, I believe. So right, and then a number of you did the recent planning commissioner mm -hmm. training. So I think that they went over that during that time. They did that a lot. So, yeah, so I'll have to read yeah. it again. Yeah. And yeah. everyone's going to be trained. Yeah, and it's it's easy to find yourself in that situation. You know, we're we're all members of the community. We talk to each other, and all of a sudden, oops, <laughs> you know, you find yourself all together. It's fine to talk about anything else, but you know, try to be careful not to talk about project specific items, yeah. and then be careful of social media. Yeah, I did want to add that. You know, I have seen um, appointed and elected officials in other jurisdictions. Um, get on social media and and talk about their positions and you know sometimes trash projects um, and you know due process is a really really important part of our constitution and uh, respecting private property rights and so um, you know it's tempting for for decision makers to get out in front of a, a topic and kind of cover for yourself when when you know the pressure's on right and when the public's complaining about a certain you know project you want to go and and defend yourself on social media and i've seen people do it and it is one of the worst things you could actually do for for yourself but you put your jurisdiction in legal jeopardy because if a project is not uh, approved then the applicant can come back and say you've um, violated my due process and um, you, know, you got 14th amendment issues you got you know fifth amendment issues and it's just a a, a place you want to avoid so um social media is uh, is a snake pit and it can be very dangerous for decision makers. I mean, the, for planning commissioners and council members on, on, on projects, it's more like you're a judge at that point. You have to really remain impartial before, before the process is worked out completely. So, um, you know, I, I hope the public understands that too. You know, you, you want to, oftentimes it, there, there's a temptation to be, to, to get the get your position out there early on, but um, you really want to take in all the information before you uh, get out and make a decision on um, on a particular project, um, especially not in a public setting. So, um, I, I think you know it's important to honor due process and and private property rights. Yeah, that's thank you for saying that. It's very very important, and I think you have to remember when you come and sit down at the meeting and at the public hearing, your decision should not ha have already been made because you haven't received all the information you need. You haven't heard the public testimony, you haven't heard staff's report. So there's no way you can make a decision because if you came with a decision made, you would have been making it without all the information you needed. So just to continue to remember that. Um, so, and that's just part of the open-mindedness, gather your information, bring it all with you to your meeting, continue to gather it while it's here. And then when it's time to, to make the decision, that is when right then and there is when the decision's made. Um, I think Christy and I can both say that in all of our years of doing this, you have commissioners that sit down there at the end when it comes to voting, wow, I came in with the, dis I was going to vote the other way, but after hearing this, I'm going to vote this way. And it's like, well, good thing you, you know, you listened to all the information because you didn't have it prior to making that first snap decision. So first snap judgment. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of brings it, wraps that up. Does anyone have any questions about this? Questions about me and my experience? Um, yeah. Are we going to get a bio on her? <laughs> Oh, that's where like a full page. <laughs> we looked her up. She's very experienced. Oh gosh. <laughs> Dave did his homework. Um, okay. I mean, I can give you a short like rundown. Well, would you history. would you please? Yeah. yeah. So I have a bachelor's degree in city and regional planning um, from Cal Poly, and I've been in the planning industry for since 2006, however long that is. Um, my main planning focus has been in small jurisdictions. So um, um, I had seven or eight years in the city of Monasterino, which is down in Santa Clara County. I've been up in the Sacramento region for eight years and have been in a handful of small communities. Um, most recently, I was the planning director for the, town, the city of Plymouth in Amador County, and I currently support two other cities in Amador County, Sutter okay. Creek and Jackson. 
and then Loomis through how you brew and associates. So. And so for members of the public, this is actually a very common um, uh, uh, arrangement that smaller jurisdictions have. You know, Loomis is is in many parts a part-time town, right? We don't have uh, full-time uh, um, garbage and water sewer. We, uh, we contract all of that out. We contract our police services, and we don't have a lot of projects. Um, but uh, there are times where we have more projects than then we have staff. And so um, there are some things that are coming down the pipeline. And, um, and so uh, it's actually a really good use of um, uh, staff because what we don't want to do is hire full-time staff and then not have any work for them to do in a house. Right. And so, um, you know, we also hire in, in the town, we hire a uh, code enforcement third party because we don't have uh, well, we haven't prioritized five days a week for, um, for code enforcement. So there's a lot of things that we contract out and um, there are projects that um, require specialties that, that um, we need specialized uh, consultants for. So this is a, I, I think a really good arrangement when those projects uh, you know, go their way and after they're approved or uh, were rejected, um, that's, that's about at the end of, of the work that we have for you. And um, just the workload is not enough to require a full-time um, member of staff um, all the time. So um, we're, I think, happy with that arrangement. And you seem to be a specialist in smaller jurisdictions, and that's welcome. Um, yeah, Christy and I actually worked together out in Amador County. That's okay. how she found me. <laughs> Great. And uh, what company do you work for, Aaron? Haugie Brewick and Associates. Okay. So Christy worked there prior Yep. Um, to her coming on full time here with the town. So, okay. Great. Well, welcome. Um, all right. Uh, any questions, comments from planning commissioners? Okay. Um, th this is not an action item, but we should open it up for public comment. There might be some questions uh, or comments from members of the public. So let's do that. Any members of the public wishing to comment or question? On the phone, any hands raised? Yeah. Okay. Let's get it going. We have Eva Marshall, I think. Is that Eva? I that's I can't see. All right, let's go uh, to the top. Pam, can you hear us? Oh, uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you. I tr wanted to give you a heads up that I tried multiple times to get on the YouTube station on my phone, and I couldn't. So I had to quickly break out my laptop to actually see the presentation but there's other people out there that could not see the actual presentation they could only hear it on the phone so I had a friend's been texting me she's out in the country with spotty internet and she could only I uh, hear hear the presentation but not see the presentation like uh I did when I raced to get my laptop off out. So do you know what the hiccup is with not being able to watch it like usual on the YouTube station for other people? YouTube. It's being recorded. We don't have Ken with us today to ah, okay. with, with YouTube. So unfortunately, um, it's not being broadcast right now. Um, anyone who wants to view it can, can view our recording later on once we have uploaded that. Um, I can also provide you with the presentation. Uh, just let me know and give me an email address and I can get that to you. So okay. on YouTube, it's, it will be uh, just not live fed. Correct. Okay, got it. Right, All right Pam. There may have been some people that might have had some questions and they're more visually like me. I'm more visually than on, on the phone. So that was my concern, but that, that explains it. Ken is not there and he's wonderful. So uh, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next. Who do we have here? Okay, take it away. Hi, this is Sonia Coupler. My question is for um, the planners, Chris, Christy and Aaron, I believe. Um, I've been hearing in the media that Governor Newsom is proposing some changes, major changes to CEQA to speed up housing projects. And I'm just curious um, what you guys have heard um, in regards to that 
Thank you. Thank you. Christy, what do you know? Uh, he's not changing CEQA, but he's changing what projects are prone to CEQA. So um, projects, certain projects on, I believe it's uh, university campuses um, will not be subject to CEQA if they meet certain criteria. Um, so there are other streamlining um, actions that also would not be subject to CEQA, but um, what I know of so far is just the um, the university sites for housing specifically, okay. not for any type of project. It has to be for housing. That include junior colleges, as far as you know. I believe so. No, okay. But again, there's limitations on what that would apply to. Um, it has to be for housing, and there might be additional criteria on the type of housing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another person with her hand raised. Is that it? Okay. Okay, seeing and hearing no other uh, public comment, we're gonna close public comment on this issue and that will, that will conclude the presentation. Thank you, Aaron, and I'm sure we'll see you back here soon when we get some uh, applications and moving along the process. Okay, uh, at this time, we are going to uh, open it up for planning director's report, Christy. So just a few items, um, our general plan update, we're continuing um, with our administrative draft EIR for the general plan update. Um, we did have some comments to get back to AECOM, they're working on that and then finalizing the alternatives evaluation um, for that EIR. Um, once it's ready, it will be released for a 45 day public review period, uh, which time comments may be submitted on the on the general plan um, update EIR. And then we'll hold a joint workshop um, on that EIR and the, the general plan update with the town council. Um, um, it's looking like that schedule is being pushed off from what you have um, in, in your packet um, and that's online. Um, we'll, it was showing, I believe June, uh, uh, July, August timeframe for that workshop. And that's probably gonna be pushed back to September. Okay. Uh, we want to make sure that there's enough review time before we hold the workshop so that people can read through it and have questions ready. Um, we're also working on the zoning ordinance update specifically targeted with the housing element um, update that was adopted. So in that housing element um, adopted in 2021, there are requirements to update the, the zoning ordinance in relation to those particular programs. Uh, it relates a lot to various state requirements for uh, different housing types, so supportive housing, emergency shelters, um, things of that nature that we didn't necessarily have in our ordinance already. Um, so it's just getting up to speed with those requirements uh, and implementing our housing element. Uh, the Hidden Grove project, uh, there's nothing new to report there at this time. We're still working with the applicant on their proposal and we're um, working to prepare an environmental impact report for that project. So when I have more information, um, I will share that with you, but there really hasn't been much uh, happening. So they have not submitted a complete application, is that So they correct? have submitted a complete application. There are questions as to the content of the application in relation to SB 330. Oh. So we're working with HCD to go through that and. Uh, figure out what the appropriate method of implementing SB 330 is in relation to some of the project components. Um, Costco, uh, they are underway. Um, so we have approved their grading, initial grading plan. Um, at the last town council meeting, we had a, an amendment on general um, mitigation measure, uh, greenhouse gas one. Um, the mitigation measure addressed uh, greenhouse gas emissions and required 67 um, charging stations. Um, when the EIR was written, it was based on the technology available at the time, which was just level two chargers, which are the slower 48 hour chargers. Um, we've bumped that up to um, the fast chargers that are available um, and are available elsewhere in our community. It makes sense with in a retail setting to have that charge done within an hour um, 
rather than having a car sitting there for all day when they don't necessarily want to be at Costco all day. <laughs> um, so they're proposing 14 fast chargers, which is more, which is double um, the um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions that um, they would have otherwise had with the level twos. So um, we're working forward on that, moving forward on that, and then working um, on their other submittals and permits, uh, building permits to get them, to keep them going okay. and, and get the building up. Uh, miscellaneous projects. I have not heard anything from the applicant on the Loomis RV campground. So I'm, uh, you'll see that's a reduction in, in item from what I had description that I had before. Um, it's pending, pending the applicant, so um, I'm, I'm shortening that up. Uh, we did receive an application from Sierra Foothill Academy um, for design review and modification of their conditional use permit to add some modular units and phases uh, for additional learning space and student resources. And uh, we're working with that applicant at this time um, on their design. So there'll be some changes um, on their initial application before I bring that forward. And then um, in-house staff, we're, we're dealing with a number of SB9 projects. So those are the lot splits um, that the state has required us to approve um, in the residential zones. Um, so we actually have quite a few in the works um, and more coming in daily. So it keeps us busy, but it's not an item I can bring forward to the council or the commission. So, uh, just just know that they're out there and people are actually actually doing those. Are those are those approvals uh, made at the uh, or those determinations whether uh, they're approved or not made at the staff level or planning commission level? It's made at the staff level, and then they are required to go through the map process and have a final map recorded. So it does go to the county with recording, and um, it, there's a referral process that goes along with it with the various service providers. Um, so sheriff, fire, uh, water, water and yep. sewer, everybody. All right. And then some miscellaneous odds and ends. Uh, National Night Out will be on Tuesday, August 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the Loomis Depot. So we'll have a barbecue and fun activities sponsored by the town and all are welcome. Uh, the Friends of the Loomis Library kicked off their Buy a Brick campaign, um, Brick Bricks will be part of their the entrance to the upcoming uh, demonstration garden at the Loomis Library. Um, if you can visit their website for more information on that. Um, we continue to have public counter hours Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to noon, if anyone wants to drop by with questions. And then our next Planning Commission regular meeting will be July 25th at 7 p.m. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. Question. Thank you for the update. Great job. I appreciate it. Uh, the only question I have is uh, with some of the updates that we see, do we, with the uh, the state budget deficit, are we aware of any impacts to any of our projects? No, I thought uh, with the economy <laughs> and high interest rates and, and things of that nature that a lot of the building um, activity would slow down, but I see no sign of that. So... Uh, in terms of the state, I don't know what that will mean in terms of their grant availability. Um, there might be limitations or limit, you know, limited funds that they can provide to communities for updates or uh, other act planning activities, housing, things like that. There, there were updates in the infrastructure bill, and that's why I didn't get a chance to review the whole thing, but I didn't see impacts on local communities, but definitely statewide major projects mm -hmm. and some delay of environmental components, so I didn't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, we're gonna open it up for commissioner's reports. Uh, if anyone has a, a report to offer, now would be the time. Okay. It, it, the state has completely overridden our general plan and zoning in that respect. 
and we are required to um, allow for lot splits regardless of the size. So it doesn't mean that if you have uh, a 10 acre lot in the uh, one acre lot minimum zone that it's not restricted to those types of lots. If you have a one acre lot in the one acre zone, you can still split it under that state law. There are conditions to that. It, you have to yes, the residency there conditions. There's there's multiple. Mm -hmm. uh, so so there are met. right right. It, it's not just a, a easy process. Um, they do need to provide all their submittals. They need to um, show. They need to sign an affidavit um, saying that they will live in one of the units on the property for three years. And then it also prevents developers from coming in and just buying lot after lot and then splitting them. So you have to, there are restrictions on if you split one lot, uh, you're restricted from then buying the adjacent lot and then splitting that again. And then if the lot has been split under SB9, it cannot be split again. So, yes. Right. They're still together, but yeah, it allows for, um, you know, a little more leeway to provide family housing. Yeah, these aren't for subdivisions. These are just uh, lot splits, single lot splits. Okay, we good? All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, staff, members, members of the public. Appreciate it.